Welcome to the Cabin of Horrors, where we let our inner killers out to play. I am your host, the Incredible Josh. It is the second episode of the Cabin of Horrors podcast. Thank you guys so much for tuning in for the second round. Can't wait for the third, fourth, hundredth, five hundredth, all the ones to come. On the second episode, we're just going to be shooting the shit on horror, talking about different horror movie reboots, some of the best classic cabin horror movies to watch this summer, and just in general, some top horror movies in the summertime just to relax, enjoy from the comfort of your own home. On the Cabin of Horrors Instagram this week, I asked my followers what their favorite scary movie was, and we're going to talk about some of those here on the podcast. So one of those scary movies that we got was Sinister, submitted by BLKRose13 on Instagram. Sinister came out in 2012, and it's a supernatural horror film that was directed and co-written by Scott Derrickson. It stars Ethan Hawke, Juliet Rylance, James Ranson, Fred Thompson, and Vincent D'Onofrio. The story of the movie is a true crime writer. His name's Ellison Oswald, played by Ethan Hawke. He discovers a series of Super 8 home movies depicting grisly murders found in the attic of his new house. And this puts his family in danger. Now, this movie, to me, was absolutely terrifying. I was definitely touched by this movie. Usually with any supernatural possession kind of movie that hits real close to home, it's definitely going to scare me to some level. So Sinister, I will definitely put that up there with one of the uh, one of the scariest horror movies. Our next favorite scary movie comes from Issa underscore Cupcake Mina. The favorite scary movie was Candyman. The 1992 gothic supernatural horror film that was written and directed by Bernard Rose. It starred Virginia Madsen, Tony Todd, Xander Berkeley, Cassie Lemons, and Vanessa Williams. The movie itself, it was based on Clive Barker's short story, The Forbidden, and follows a Chicago graduate student completing a thesis on urban legends and folklore. This, in her research, leads her to the legend of Candyman the ghost of an African-American artist and the son of a slave who was murdered in the late 19th century for his relationship with the daughter of a wealthy white man. Now, this movie is definitely up there for me as one of my favorite horror movies of all time. Every Valentine's Day or around Valentine's, whenever that season hits, this is the movie I watch. I absolutely love Candyman. I love the underlying tones of it. And Tony Todd definitely is a frightening villain. And that voice, as soon as you hear that voice, it just sends chills down your spine. I know it does me. I don't know about you. But Tony Todd's voice will always send chills down my spine. Our next favorite scary movie was submitted by Elizabeth underscore 4M on Instagram, and it was The Devil's Rejects, one of my favorite horror movie sequels of all time. Came out in 2005, produced and directed by Rob Zombie. It's the second film in the Firefly film series and is the sequel to House of a Thousand Corpses. It centers around three members of the psychopathic antagonist family from the previous film, so Firefly family. Uh, They're now seen as villainous protagonists. Sid Haig, Bill Mosley, and Zombie's wife, Sherry Moon Zombie, all come back, reprise their roles for the family, and really go on a complete murderous rampage and show everybody why they're boss. I love Devil's Rejects. I absolutely loved what Rob Zombie did with the direction of the franchise. Um, Not one for three from hell. Kind of meh for me in terms of a franchise as a whole. But I love The Devil's Rejects. One of the greatest sequels ever. Speaking of sequels... The horror genre is definitely not lacking any of those. When it comes to horror movie reboots, remakes, redones, however you want to label it, the horror genre is plagued with them. And it's because audiences adore horror movie killers, right? We love the villain. We love Jason. We love Michael. We love Freddy. These are the people that we go to the movies for. We don't watch Friday the 13th because of the camp counselor, right? We don't watch A Nightmare on Elm Street because we like to watch a bunch of high school kids. No, we watch it because we want to see Jason Voorhees stab someone with a machete and we want to watch Freddy Krueger terrorizing teenagers. We watch these we watch these horror movies because of the villains and the killers that are in them. We connect with them. And we enjoy watching them savagely lay their victims to rest. That's the magic of the horror genre. But because of that, and because of our love for these characters, movie production companies, all they see is big dollar signs all over popular horror franchises. That's really what has plagued 
the horror genre with reboots. And it's not to say that every reboot's bad because it's it's not. There's been some really good reboots, but there's been even more that have been really bad. You know, whether it be a new sequel to an original movie set 30 years later or a complete revitalization of a franchise, we keep continuing to see more franchises go through this reboot phase. We have a new Blair Witch movie coming along. There's going to be a Jeepers Creepers movie coming out near the end of this year. There's just so many reboots, not enough original content. There is some original content, right? We have Nope coming out by Jordan Peele this year. That's original. That's not a reboot of a previous movie. Let's take a look at some of the good reboots and some of the bad reboots that we've seen in the horror genre. Now I'm going to start with a good one. We're going to talk a little bit about one of my favorites. If you listen to the first episode, you know exactly who I'm going to go into here, and that's Halloween, Halloween 2018. Directed by David Gordon Green, currently holds a 79% score on Rotten Tomatoes, and it's a horror movie reboot that plays as a direct sequel to Halloween 1978. So it retcons the continuity of the movies before it. Laurie and Michael aren't brother and sister. The Curse of the Thorn is not a thing. It doesn't exist. The only canon that exists in this reboot is from the first movie in 1978. And the movie itself, the reboot, released in 2018. And it's the 11th installment in the Halloween franchise and sees Jamie Lee Curtis reprise her role as Laurie Strode. And we see Nick Castle reprise his role as Michael Myers. The movie itself, it follows Laurie Strode's life 40 years after she survived the killing spree on Halloween night. Her family's in complete shambles and she's obviously suffering from PTSD after the events that occurred that night on Halloween. She continues to believe Michael's going to come back, attempts to prepare her family for what she believes to be the inevitable... And when Michael Myers is set to be transferred to another facility, he breaks out during transport and proceeds towards Haddonfield. So we all know where he's going at that point. He's going for, well, what we believe is Laurie Strode. Now, this isn't the first time the Halloween franchise has been part of the horror movie reboot club. The franchise was first rebooted in 1998 with Halloween H2O, which to me is one of the most underrated movies in the Halloween franchise. I love Halloween H2O. I remember seeing that movie as a kid when it came out and I watched it on VHS and I absolutely loved how badass they made Laurie Strode. She was not taking any shit. As soon as shit started going down and her phone was cut and she knew her kid hadn't gone to Yosemite, she grabbed that gun and went hunting for Michael. She was not fucking around. And I absolutely loved that Laurie Strode and how the reunion between the two of them met between the door. I just, everything about Halloween H2O was just the perfect Halloween movie, in my opinion. I absolutely adored it. Now, the series was completely remade again when Rob Zombie took the helm and released his version of Michael Myers in 2007 and also released a sequel in 2009. Now, that complete remake universe, in my opinion, is absolute garbage. Uh, John Carpenter himself was even against the portrayal of Michael Myers in the Rob Zombie remake. He wasn't happy with how he was portrayed. And I absolutely agree. After Rob Zombie's sequel was released in 2009, the rights to the franchise were lost because no further follow-ups were being produced in the franchise. They tried, but it kept getting halted, probably due to the lack of success of the sequel. (laughs) Now, it was at that time that John Carpenter got involved with Bloomhouse Productions, regained the rights to the Halloween franchise. And then he actually helped the studio make this 2018 horror movie reboot. So with that support directly from John Carpenter, the guy who literally created Halloween, he, he's, he's the man behind the 1978 Halloween. By doing that, you're making this reboot destined to be a good entry in the franchise. You're taking that canon, you're taking that legacy and that vision and bringing it to life in a modern age. You can't go wrong. That, that's the recipe for success, right? Like having the creator of the franchise as a sounding board, it can only benefit the writers and the directors. When they're trying to appeal to old and new audiences alike, you get that mixture of ideas and innovation and you're able to touch both audiences in a completely different way. Now, while this sequel is considered a horror movie reboot, it still holds true to the original 1978 Halloween movie while still giving audiences something new. As I was mentioning about Halloween H2O, they portrayed Laurie as a strong and confident woman in, in that entry in the franchise. That's, that's how we saw her. 
But in Halloween 2018, she plays more of the victim role. She's frail. She comes off as weak. She's suffering from PTSD because of what happened 40 years ago. All of these things can be seen through her character. And you, you can see her sadness and her guilt and just her overall anxiety towards life. And that's not a Laurie Strode that we've really seen before, but it is accurate, really, if you think about it, if you're just starting it from the events of the first Halloween. But despite all of that, despite that portrayal and how she may seem weak and frail at times, she still prepares herself and her family to take on Michael Myers. She was still badass by the end of that movie. The traps she had set, the way she laid them out, it was just bad ass and she continues even so in halloween kills halloween kills she is still a badass old lady ready to take michael down i absolutely love laurie strode my favorite final girl of all time and i will stand behind the fact that the halloween 2018 reboot is a good horror movie reboot now let's talk about a bad horror movie reboot one that was released in 2015 directed by gil kennan and has a Rotten Tomato score of 30%. We're going to talk about Poltergeist. The movie was released by 20th Century Fox in 2015, and it serves as a remake of the 1982 film, and it's the fourth installment in the Poltergeist franchise. The movie stars Sam Rockwell, Rosemary DeWitt, Jared Harris, and Jane Addams. The plot surrounds a family arriving at their new home who begin to experience paranormal activity. While the movie itself it was considered a moderate box office success. Many fans of the franchise and the genre were really critical towards the film. It's because the entire movie really uses jump scares and that's about it. It's really excessive to the point where you may just begin to start laughing at certain times because it's just, it's ridiculous how many jump scares they were using as a form of fear and to just evoke some sort of emotion out of their audience. And then you mix that in with the terrible writing <laughs> and even worse implementation of CGI the remake is definitely inferior to the film. It's it's not in any way, shape, or form good, or even holds a flame to any entry, whether it be the first one or the second one or the third one. It it, it doesn't even belong. The remake, it, it really didn't add anything new to the franchise. It wasn't exciting. It wasn't different. It wasn't unique. It competently paid homage to the original, but it just it stands as a fundamentally unnecessary film in the franchise. Some fans actually even wondered whether the movie was meant to be a spoof or satire on the genre and its tropes within it. The film just drones on with its use of horror movie tropes. It uses so many of them that it's apparent that it's used as a crutch, really, to just like keep fans of the horror genre watching to see what kind of stupid horror movie tropes they're going to be using next. It's just ridiculously predictable. It completely lacks originality. It has no uniqueness. It's not only an unforgettable movie in the Poltergeist franchise, but really in the whole genre, genre altogether, right? As a horror movie itself, it's completely unforgettable. There's nothing unique about it. There's nothing memorable about it. It just makes it a superfluous horror movie reboot, really, at the end of the day. I want to talk about one of my favorite horror movie reboots of all time. This franchise itself is... Definitely in my top three favorite horror franchises of all time. And when this reboot was announced, I was super concerned until I realized that original people were going to be at the helm of making sure that it was a good reboot. What we're talking about is Evil Dead. The Evil Dead reboot that came out in 2013, directed by Fede Alvarez, and currently holds a 63% score on Rotten Tomatoes. Evil Dead, the 2013 remake, was released as a soft horror movie reboot of the original series while still continuing the lore of the franchise. It's the fourth installment in the Evil Dead franchise. It stars Jane Levy, Shiloh Fernandez, Lou Taylor Pucci, Jessica Lucas, and Elizabeth Blackmore. And the story of the film pays homage to the original Evil Dead, which I really love. That was one of my favorite things. The cabin was reminiscent. Everything about the woods just felt Evil Dead. And I absolutely loved that. And it really pays homage to it with a group of friends staying at a remote cabin in the woods. But the reboot takes a slightly different turn than the original. They're not just going for a vacation away with a bunch of friends. They're actually holding an intervention for one of their friends. And it makes things a lot more interesting when supernatural entities are released in the cabin. One of the guys, one of the friends that goes out to the cabin finds a book. And this book is written in a different language, a whole, has a whole bunch of demonic images in it. And he starts reading from it. 
Well, when he does that, he summons demons and entities that begin to possess each and every one of them and goes on a murderous rampage. There is a difference, though, between this Evil Dead reboot and every other movie that came before it. It does have a significant change, which comes in the form of its humor, or lack thereof. The original movies in the Evil Dead franchise were campy. They were full of humor. They had the insatiable Bruce Campbell in the iconic role of Ash Williams. And he was funny. There was a lot of humor in every single Evil Dead movie, and it felt campy. But this reboot really shies away from the humor of the Evil Dead movies before it and really gives us a more frightening experience. What it lacks in comedy, it adds back really with brutal terror, gore, and just sheer bloody violence, which I enjoyed. It, it felt more like a horror movie instead of a horror comedy. In terms of continuity, it's believed that the movie takes place either before or during the events of the TV show Ash vs. Evil Dead. The movie itself, it pays homage to the original in many ways, while giving it a fresh splatter of blood. Many scenes from the first Evil Dead movie can be spotted as Easter eggs throughout the horror movie reboot, which I really enjoyed. There's a lot of iconic scenes from the first Evil Dead that are remade and kind of shot in a similar way to give you that Easter egg for the original Evil Dead fans. Really liked how they did that, but my favorite thing of all, 100% about the Evil Dead reboot, is that the film didn't utilize any CGI. It made production more demanding. It took them 70 days of shooting at night to really achieve the result they got, but they didn't utilize any CGI whatsoever in the making of that film, which is one of my favorite aspects because I'm not a CGI fan. I understand it's necessary in certain situations, but practical effects will always reign supreme over CGI any day. Back to completely unnecessary horror movie reboots, we're about to talk about Prom Night which was released in 2008, directed by Nelson McCormick, and holds a Rotten Tomatoes score of 7%. That should tell you off the bat exactly how good this movie is. Prom Night was released as a loose remake of the 1980 film, and it wasn't received well by anybody. It stars Brittany Snow, Scott Porter, Jessica Stroop, Dana Davis, Collins Penny, Kelly Blatz, James Ranson, Brianne Davis, Jonathan Skaich, and Idris Elba. And the plot, it, similar to the original, surrounds a high school student named Donna who witnesses her former teacher brutally murder her entire family because she, he's obsessed with her. And then the movie fast-forwards three years to Donna's senior prom. Teacher escapes custody, begins to stalk her, kills anybody who gets in the way of reuniting him with Donna. Your, your typical slasher and prom night story. Now, the original movie itself, it wasn't bad but it really wasn't considered iconic or a cult classic slasher movie by any means. It's not a Halloween. It's not a slumber party massacre. And because of this, many fans of the genre went into this movie already with low expectations, but those expectations were still too high. And I think the biggest mistake they made is they didn't screen the reboot in advance for any critics. <laughs> like maybe if they screened it in advance before it made a universal release, they could have known how much it sucked <laughs> and maybe made some adjustments so it could have been a halfway decent horror movie reboot. But it wasn't even that. It, it, it didn't bring anything unique. It didn't bring anything different. It was a complete waste of time. And it just, it didn't matter. It was a reboot that didn't need to be done. It was called Predictable by Critics, a dull slasher film. There is nothing good about the Prom Night remake. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to warn everybody ahead of time on this next one. Because I know I'm going to take some heat. I know I'm going to hear about this one way or another. Because this reboot definitely divided the horror community. I saw a lot of love for it, but I also saw a lot of hate for it. We're going to talk about Texas Chainsaw Massacre that released this year, directed by David Blue Garcia, currently holds a 32% score on Rotten Tomatoes. I know. <laughs> I know. I said it was good. I'm saying it's good. That is, that is what we're going to side with on this podcast, is that the Texas Chainsaw Massacre reboot was good. It was released as a Netflix exclusive movie. It's the ninth installment in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise. It starred Sarah Yarkin, Elsie Fisher, Mark Burnham, Moe Dunford, Neil Hudson, Jessica Elaine, Olwyn Fuer, Jacob Lattimore, and Alice Kriege. And it's considered to be a direct sequel to the original entry in the franchise, so the first Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie. And it starts decades after the original, with a group of young adults looking to what we believe is start up a new community of sorts. 
Problem is, they walked right into Leatherface's house, and obviously he doesn't like visitors. He doesn't want people building on his community. So he comes out, he begins brutally slaying all of these people in typical Leatherface fashion. And like, I'm, like I said, audiences, critics, everyone in the horror community had varied opinions on this horror movie reboot. Many felt that the movie had great gore, brutal kills, which it did. But Leatherface wasn't terrifying as he was in previous installments. They felt that he was kind of dulled down and wasn't as scary as he should have been. Others criticized the fact that it used real-world elements like social media, buzzwords like cancel culture when they're on the bus. And I've seen some fans actually commenting on the comparisons it has to Halloween 2018 as well, in that some scenes appear to be a direct ripoff of the film. All of these points are valid, 100%. But there's one thing to keep in mind when it comes to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise. It's, it's also kind of synonymous with the Halloween franchise as well. And it's that killers like Leatherface and Michael and killers like Leatherface and Michael, they, they don't need to have an intricate lore attached to them. These are entities that have one goal, create death and chaos everywhere they go. Why do we need backstories or reasons for why they do what they do? Why, why do we need that? This really only complicates future installments and then it puts limitations on where the character can go in the future. Just let them be chaotic and brutally murder absolutely everybody that they can. <laughs> That's their purpose. Why do you need to create more lore behind them? I understand having a little bit of lore, but the more you add, the more intricate it gets, and then expectations become higher for future installments, which I think was a big problem here with Texas Chainsaw Massacre. But as a whole, like I said, this was a good horror movie reboot, and we stand behind that on this podcast. It had all the great kills you'd expect from Leatherface, along with the practical effects to match. Nothing really felt overdone, even the bus scene, that felt necessary for a Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie. It was just a well-orchestrated production of sheer chaos. I've got one more horror movie reboot to talk about today, and it's definitely a bad one. Probably one of the absolute worst, and I guarantee not a single person will disagree with me. And that reboot is A Nightmare on Elm Street, released in 2010 by Samuel Bayer and holds a Rotten Tomato score of 15%. And there are so many reasons <laughs> why this movie is up there as one of the worst horror movie reboots of all time. It serves as a direct remake of the 1984 film. It stars Jackie Earl Haley, Kyle Gallner, Rooney Mara, Katie Cassidy, Thomas Decker, and Kellen Lutz. And the story itself, it does stay true to the original at least. It centers the plot around a group of teenagers who live on the same street and are murdered in their dreams by a disfigured man named Freddy Krueger. Eventually, the teenagers band together and discover they all share a common link from their childhood, which is what is making them targets for Freddy. Now, I hope you noticed, if you haven't seen this reboot and you were maybe thinking about it, I hope you noticed when I was naming the cast that there was a very crucial name missing, Robert Ungland. <laughs> That's right, they recasted the role of Freddy Krueger in this horror movie reboot of A Nightmare on Elm Street. Not only this, but they strayed away from many of the elements that Wes Craven developed for both the character and the franchise. Instead of that, you know, comical one-line quip in Freddy we got, Welcome to primetime, bitch! Like, instead of that, we were met with some sort of attempt at being more frightening and dark. But really, he just looked like a burn victim because they utilized CGI in developing the face of Freddy instead of using the prosthetics like they did on Ungland. It was a CGI face to try and make it look more like a burn victim, but it didn't look real. It didn't look legitimate and it didn't look scary in any way, shape or form. Now, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Audiences and critics alike criticized this movie because it, it lacked depth and originality. The characters felt undeveloped, the plot we've seen played out a million times before, and originally, the writers tried to attempt creating the movie in a similar way to the Friday the 13th reboot, basically taking elements from each of the franchise's movies that worked and try to connect them into one cohesive storyline, but instead, they opted to just take Wes Craven's vision and try to make it more dark and terrifying. But how do you get more scarier than that? So, a monster that is completely disfigured with night coming out of his hands at like claws chasing you in his dream in your dreams and if he catches you you die he can kill you in your dreams 
what more of a terrifying concept do you need? I don't understand why they needed to take this and make it more dark and frightening. It was already dark and frightening. You just needed to bring something new to the table. And this remake didn't do that. Even if they tried to go the same route of Friday the 13th and utilize different pieces of the franchise to create a cohesive storyline, that didn't even work for Friday the 13th. <laughs> if we want to talk about bad reboots, Friday the 13th is definitely another bad reboot right there. And speaking of Friday the 13th, that's a perfect segue into talking about some cabin horror movies that are perfect to watch while you're hiding under the covers. If you're planning on going out to the cabin this summer, these are the perfect movies to watch to make sure that you are staying scared. Anytime you need a scare in a cabin, these are the movies that you want to watch. Really, cabin horror movies are one of the most frightening concepts in the horror genre. Imagine planning a trip away from the chaos that fills your day-to-day -day life and you find a cabin that's gorgeous, it's amazing, it has the perfect setting so you can take in that relaxation time. Once you get there, you spend all your time surviving a killer and <laughs> it's terrifying. It's, it's borderline frustrating when you think about it after all the work you put in. So why not instead of going to the cabin this summer, you stay at home under the covers and watch some other people experience some terror while they go out into the woods. One of those movies that is a great cabin horror movie is The Strangers. In 2008, Brian Burton now shocked audiences in his directorial debut, and it's a terrifying cabin horror movie. The movie itself, it received mixed reviews from critics, and many praised the realism and tense atmosphere that it was able to create. This is really in part to real-life events that the screenplay takes inspiration from. The director experienced a series of break-ins as a kid, and that really helped serve as his inspiration for the film's tense atmosphere. And then he also utilized inspiration from the multiple homicides of the Manson family Tate murders. So you combine those two experiences together, and you make a horror movie out of it? That is absolutely terrifying. The movie itself, it stars Liv Tyler and Scott Speedman. There are a couple who are taking some time away at their cabin vacation home, enjoying time to themselves, and their lives are completely disrupted by three masked psychopaths. The psychopaths break into their home, take them hostage, and really try to mess with their lives and absolutely scare the living crap out of them and kill them. <laughs> the movie itself, it can be classified under the slasher subgenre, and it doesn't really follow the typical tropes of a slasher film, which kind of adds to that terrifying feeling of the movie, because there's no one doing drugs, there's no one committing acts of debauchery or causing problems like in a normal slasher movie. You can tell who's going to die in a slasher movie and in what order. It's, it's obvious. There's a reason behind the, the logic of horror movie tropes, but that's not happening here in this movie. There's not really any of those horror movie tropes. It's just simply a couple of people taking some time away for themselves when terror strikes the concept itself is is absolutely frightening and we can't talk about cabin horror movies without talking about of course evil dead i know we talked about it a little bit but evil dead is an amazing cabin horror movie especially the reboot the fourth installment of the evil dead franchise definitely one to check out definitely one that i would watch anytime i'm planning to go out in a cabin in the woods evil dead 100%. I would even probably say it's the best cabin horror movie of all time <laughs> and really paved the way for cabin horror movies. It kind of set the template for what you would expect from that subgenre of horror. One that really pulled inspiration from Evil Dead, in my opinion, was The Cabin in the Woods. Without Evil Dead, you wouldn't get The Cabin in the Woods. And I know this movie, it sparks a lot of debate in the horror community. But it's still a decent cabin horror movie, and it was directed by Drew Goddard and produced by Joss Whedon. It was set to be released in 2010, but the film experienced financial problems and was then picked up by Lionsgate in 2011. It was an attempt to revitalize the slasher genre while serving as a critical satire on torture porn. So really, it's a good idea. Some people may not like how the story itself was executed, but for what it was, it was a good movie. Uh, it stars Kristen Connolly, Chris Hemsworth, Anna Hutchinson, Fran Kranz, Jesse Williams, Richard Jenkins, and Bradley Whitford. It's about a group of college students who retreat to a remote forest when they become victims to backwood zombies. But little do they know, there's a series of technicians who are manipulating the events from an underground facility. The concept itself is very unique. It's, it's not a concept that you really saw in horror at all. Some may even say it's not technically a cabin horror movie, but it is. It's set in a cabin. It has the atmosphere of a cabin. At the end of the day, it is a cabin horror movie, so I rank it as one that should be watched anytime that you're looking to go to a cabin. Another movie that you definitely have to include in 
any cabin horror movie discussion is the iconic entry to the subgenre, Friday the 13th. You cannot have a cabin horror movie discussion without some sort of mention of Camp Crystal Lake. Friday the 13th was released in 1980, and it was actually advertised by director Sean Cunningham before the movie was even filmed. They had put it out there to kind of gauge audiences after the success of John Carpenter's Halloween, and they wanted to see how much interest they could get and if it was even worth to do that movie. And once they got all that interest... Screenplay was quickly developed because the advertising worked. Friday the 13th stars Betsy Palmer, Adrian King, Harry Crosby, Laurie Bartram, Mark Nelson, Jeanine Taylor, Robbie Morgan, and Kevin Bacon. And the story takes place at Camp Crystal Lake, where tragedy had struck years before when a child drowned because of negligent camp counselors. Years later, the camp reopens and a new group of camp counselors begin to be slayed by an unknown killer. And they're warned, right? (laughs) It's got a death curse. They had their warning. And they're trying to basically survive in a cabin, right? It's on camp. There's tons of cabins. It's a cabin horror movie. And definitely one of the best to watch. Even when it comes to horror movies. I absolutely love that movie. And I consider this next one to be a secret cabin horror movie of mine. Because I feel it's underrated. It's not really talked about at all in the horror community. I want to talk about Secret Window. Now, if you're planning on isolating yourself in a remote cabin at any point, you may want to avoid watching this movie. (laughs) But if you really want to give yourself a good thrill in isolation, definitely get yourself Secret Window. Released in 2004, it was directed by David Cope, and it was based on the novella by Stephen King. The story first appeared in 1990 in a collection that that was published by the author called Four Past Midnight. Secret Window stars Johnny Depp and John Turturro. It's a psychologically terrifying film, and it will ensure you don't want to take cabin trips alone. You you have been warned. The story itself, it centers around a successful writer who's in the midst of a painful divorce while trying to continue his writings. He starts to be stalked at his remote cabin by a would-be author who accuses him of plagiarism. And it just goes on from there. I'm not going to say more without spoiling anything, because I don't know if I can. <laughs> But you definitely need to see that movie at any point. If you've never seen Secret Window, it's definitely one that you should be putting at the top of your list. And last but not least in our list of cabin horror movies to check out is one that's going to leave you shaking with a fever by the end of it. Released in 2002, it was the directorial debut of the iconic horror director Ellie Roth. The movie we're going to talk about is Cabin Fever. It stars Ryder Strong, Jordan Ladd, James DeBello, Serena Vincent, Joey Kern, and Giuseppe Andrews. And as most summer horror movies go, it's a story that centers around a group of college students who stay at a cabin in the woods, and then they begin to fall victim to a flesh-eating virus. It's an absolutely awesome time. It's a great movie. It's really fun. It's very entertaining. I would definitely recommend it to anybody who's you know going out into the cabin and just wants a movie that doesn't necessarily seem like it may happen to them you know it's not a slasher (laughs) but it's still something that's absolutely terrifying to think of if it could happen and ellie roth himself he was inspired to write the script of cabin fever based on a skin infection he experienced while he was traveling abroad and many of his favorite horror films were used as inspiration for the movie movies like texas chainsaw massacre last house on the left evil dead all of those are inspirations in cabin fever and when you're watching the movie you can definitely see where those inspirations come in There's a few Easter eggs that if you're really watching and your eyes are keen, you'll be able to catch them and really enjoy that movie. Now, if you're planning on staying inside and you're not really going to the cabin, you just want to have some good movies to watch for the summer, I've got a few here that you definitely should check out if you haven't already. But if you have, they're always worth another rewatch. One of those movies that we're going to talk about is I Know What You Did Last Summer. Iconic horror movie that I feel doesn't get enough attention because people may put it under the teenage slasher sub 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 genre, but I think it's definitely a great movie and one you should watch every summer. It was released in 1997, directed by Jim Gillespie, and it really introduced a new slasher franchise to the genre because there's sequels and there's TV shows that have come from it afterwards. The original star Jennifer Love Hewitt, Sarah Michelle Gellar, Ryan Phillippe, and Freddie Prince Jr. So stacked cast for 1997. Those were all stars at the time, especially heartthrob level teenage stars, if you want to label it that way. Uh, The story of I Know What You Did Last Summer focuses on those four teenagers who are involved in a drunk driving accident that kills a man. One year later, they begin to be stalked by a hook-wielding killer. 
In the film itself, it's loosely adapted from a 1973 novel of the same name. It also draws inspiration from the urban legend of The Hook. There's also inspiration from slasher films like Prom Night, House on Sorority Row. Those kind of slasher films really laid their mark on I Know What You Did Last Summer, and you can really see those underlying tones as the movie goes through. But I would definitely check it out if you've never watched it. And if you have, give it a rewatch. See if it stands the test of time for you, because it's really a great slasher movie and a great summer movie. Another great summer movie, which may be one of the greatest of all time because it prevented a lot of people from going swimming on the beach for decades, <laughs> is Jaws, released in 1975, directed by Steven Spielberg. The movie, of course, made everyone afraid to go in the water, <laughs> right? It stars Roy Scheider, Robert Shaw, Richard Dreyfus, Lorraine Gray, and Murray Hamilton. And it's about a great white shark, which goes on a man-eating rampage against those on the beach at a summer resort town. Then a team of locals band together and go on a hunt for the man-eating killer shark. And Jaws really played a role in establishing the summer season as a prime time for studios to release blockbuster movies. It wasn't before. That wasn't how blockbuster movies were released. They were usually released in the winter time. That, that was where they saw the most popularity. But with the release of Jaws, summer blockbusters started to become a thing. So it really not only changed the horror genre, but it changed summer blockbusters as we see them, as we get to experience them so really that makes it an iconic summer movie let alone an iconic horror movie and another great summer movie that you need to watch is my personal favorite horror comedy of all time anybody that you ask will tell you how much i love this movie how much i adore this movie i find it one of the absolute funniest not only executed movies but the concept itself is absolutely epic and this movie does not get the love it deserves we're going to talk about Tucker and Dale versus Evil. It released in 2010 and was directed by, by Eli Craig. And it's one of the most underrated horror comedies of all time. Nobody knows about it and it's so underground. And it's a spoof homage to classic Cabin in the Woods movies that came before it. It stars Tyler Labine, Alan Tudyk, Katrina Bowden, Jesse Moss, and Shalane Simmons. It's a story about two hillbillies who go vacationing to their cabin in the woods, and they're mistaken as killers by a group of college students. Hijinks ensue, and each party believes the other's trying to kill them. Now, this movie is a series of unfortunate circumstances, <laughs> because there's so many things that happen in this movie that could be prevented, but at the same time, it's understandable why they happened, and they lead to tragedy, <laughs> and different perceptions and interpretations of what's happening from multiple points of view. It's absolutely hilarious, and if you're into slasher movies, it is the ultimate twist that you need to watch. You're going to laugh your ass off. It is the funniest horror comedy you will ever watch. I put it above Shaun of the Dead, and I know those are brave talking words, and I may get some heat for that, but I put this movie above Shaun of the Dead for horror comedies. It is number one. Shaun of the Dead is number two. So that wraps us up for the second episode of the Cabin of Horrors podcast. Thank you again for tuning in. Hope you checked out episode one. If you haven't yet, go check it out. We talked about 90s horror movies and their iconic stamp on the horror genre. You can also get more horror content by visiting our website, cabinofhorrors.com. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, at The Cabin of Horrors. And we'll be back again next week with episode three. <laughs>